Hey, Gabriel Blake. Hey, Gabriel Jose. Where are we today? Well, just yesterday we found out the Bay Area is extending their shelter in place orders. So we are still at our respective apartments. Good, good. Because I got the feeling, as we mentioned a couple of times, the shelter in place is going to last until we are all vaccinated. I would not doubt that in the slightest, and I'm exhausted. Every day my husband asks me, what do you want to do today? And my response is, there's nothing to do. Let's just sit on the couch and watch Gossip Girl. <laughs> Honestly, I feel that there is way many things that you can do and watch before watching Gossip Girl. That's fair, that's fair, but dark times, desperate times call for, so desperate, for desperate times. For <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, that's completely fair. I never watch it, maybe I'm like just missing a masterpiece, maybe I will wait for the Criterion Collection of Gossip Girl. All joking aside, I did start to watch it because HBO Max would not stop recommending it because I think they're desperate to own the, the, the rights to distribute certain television shows, like Friends. They want to be considered a platform with a ton of content. So I was like, okay, like I'm all for des uh, for guilty pleasures. Like I love Desperate Housewives. I would watch something like that again. The plot of Gossip Girl is so fucking incoherent. It's so bad. It's so bad. Now, you mentioned Desperate Housewives. It's also a guilty pleasure of mine. But I would say that it's better than it has the right to be. You know, it's campy, it's campy, it's, it's pretty stupid from time to time, it's pretty far-fetched, whatever. But there is there is a talent that it goes into writing that kind of show. And I think that the writing is like top-notch. For doing what they're doing, they do it like the best way. Agreed. I don't think Desperate Housewives is a bad show. I don't think it's like what we like to refer to as elevated. <laughs> but it's compelling as shit. Like, you can't yeah. stop watching that <laughs> Yep, yep. I yeah, I remember that from the what was the name of the uh, of the girl that commits suicide at the beginning, and then she does the opening uh, for the every Ranger. single episode. Yeah, I don't remember her name, but I I know I even know the actress, but I can't think of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were like just hearing her voice, and they were like just like trigger about like yep, yeah, um, um, here goes one hour of my life. I'm not going to be like just pulling my eyes out of this. Now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> But yeah, uh, we didn't watch any TV this time. What did we watch this time, actually? We watched the 1986 cult classic, Blue Velvet, directed by David Lynch, starring Laura Dern, Kyle MacLachlan, Dennis Hooper, Isabella Rossellini. Yeah. I think that, yeah. yeah a, pretty amazing, a pretty amazing overall uh, cast, yeah. I have to say. Um, and this, I think that it was my pick. And so I wanted to see this first connecting with uh, Ice Way Sat. Not, not so much from the sexual perspective, but very has a bit of sex. It's not really like the uh, driving of the story. I think that it was a bit more about like the underbelly kind of thing about like what is hidden below the surface, but it has always been there in front of us. That is a topic that I think that brought in Seri common. And the other part was because of when we were celebration, I remember that I tried to watch it back then and I didn't feel too engaged. And when I watched Blue Velvet, I found it and I feel pretty bad with myself for saying this. I found it pretty dumb. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, when I finished watching it, it's like, God, no, the dad was me. It was not the movie. <laughs> so, but I don't want to give away too much about my opinion. So the other thing that I want to say is that like, this is a clear case of product placement. Or even, I don't even know, I think that it's even, not product placement, I think that David Lynch makes fun for that, about like how product placement happens some other times. With the, with the beer? With Heineken, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, this podcast is not a sponsor with Heineken. We are not endorsed with by Heineken in any kind of way. But if Heineken is listening, if Mr. Heineken is listening to this and wants to see us to send us free beer, we will gladly accept. We both love Heineken. It's refreshing and tasty. Yeah, we could say that he's the king of beers. <laughs> <laughs> but what is this movie about? 
Uh, okay, so before I do the synopsis, you have seen this before. Yep. When is the last yep. time you saw it? I only saw it once, like, 17 years ago or 15 okay. years ago. So I've seen this movie, not a remarkable amount, but I've seen it three or four times. Um, but it's been a while since I've seen it as well, so I was looking forward to revisiting it. Um, and you and I were having a conversation before we started recording. Even if we don't like what we're watching by David Lynch, I think we both enjoy very much being in his weird world. Um, I agree with that part, but I also think that there are like degrees of uh, quality on his cinema. So while at heart, and these, they, albeit both of them, they have Laura Dern, is that they belong to two different worlds. That's fair. Um, so. As far as a synopsis, I actually own this movie on Blu-ray, and I watched the entire film, and then I watched a tremendous amount of lost footage that was inc included on the Blu-ray, so stop me if I say anything that's not included in the actual original oh, release okay. of the film. Um, but the film stars or follows Jeffrey Beaumont, who is a young man who was at college, and he's called home because his father was in a terrible accident. Or they, never, they never they never disclosed that. You know, it basically the movie opens with a very idyllic shot. Sorry, like shot of the city. We even see like the fire truck, you know, like just going with the dog and the guy like just saying hi. And then we see the father, Jeffrey's father, like just watering the garden and he has an attack. And then the next yeah, scene that we see. Yeah, is that we don't have like a setup about like where Jeffrey comes from. Is that the next scene is basically that just Jeffrey walking towards the hospital. But we oh, don't they know never talk about him in college? Nope. Oh, interesting. Okay, yep. well, this is what I got from the, the lost footage. Okay, so Jeffrey comes home to this bucolic anywhere in, in the USA town. It's, it's picture perfect. Um, I don't remember the name, but let's just call it Pleasantville. It's a Lumberton. Okay. Pleasantville. <laughs> Pleasantville. Um, so I believe he's walking between his house and the hospital to visit his father. He's walking through a field and he discovers a, a severed human ear. And he... I will highlight, sorry, sorry. I will highlight that pretty quickly that uh, when the father, there is like this uh, visual effect that they do this, like when the father is suffering a stroke and is like, just rolling on the grass, you know, like unable to move. They say like the camera goes down and it says like the grass and it starts like just showing like a lot of insects, you know, like coming up, like in a disturbing kind of way. When he goes to the hospital, we can see like they, uh, they never said exactly what happened to the father, at least on, yeah. on my version. It's like something we don't know if it was an injury, a heart attack, but we see that he has like the head like completely mobilized with these like large like metal bars and he yeah, cannot like barely talk. Yeah, yeah, but it's like it's, it's disturbing. It's like how they have it. It's like it's pretty. It's yeah. It made me feel super uncomfortable. And I will say that opening shot where we see the camera from up at like uh, you know face level, and then it descends into the underbelly of the grass, and you see these insects. It's one of the best shots in the entire film. Um, He's not one for subtlety, David Lynch, and I think you understand fully what the film's going to be about. Oh, yeah. So, um, his, his name is Jeffrey. Jeffrey yeah. discovers this ear, and he becomes very intrigued. He turns it over to the police. The policeman he turns it over to has a beautiful, very innocent, pure daughter who's played by Laura Dern. Her name is Sandy. Um, the two of them kind of become co-conspirators, and they want to dive into this mystery. Where did the ear come from? Um, the ear leads them to a singer played by Isabella Rossellini. Her name is Dorothy Valens. Um, they continue to investigate her. They find out her situation is very weird. Dennis Hopper plays a man named Frank Booth, who has some sort of control over Dorothy Valens, but we don't know why. Um, and Jeffrey, who wants to investigate, pretends to be a pest control, like a pest sprayer in her apartment. Because he works at a hardware store, so that's like the best excuse that he can find. So he ends up hiding in her closet and stealing her keys, and he becomes very voyeuristic 
and it becomes intensely sexual at that point. Not pornographic, but the, the sexual nature of the, the storyline can't be denied. Um, and through his voyeurism, he discovers Dennis Hopper is abusing her in a very sexual way. It seems like she may have a child and a husband that, Den that um, what is the name of Dennis Hopper's? Frank. Frank that Frank may have kidnapped them. This is all supposition on Jeffrey's part. Yeah, um, and the year may be long to the husband. To her husband. To Don. Yeah. yeah. But so much of this remains very vague. Um, yeah, so important. he has some sort of sexual attraction to Dorothy Valens. She ends up raping him at knife point, which I had completely forgotten. Um, but they fall into kind of this weird sexual attraction. Um, so he wants to like save her, but at the same time his co-conspirator is Sandy, who's Lord Dern. And it's very clear that he has this like, the virgin and the whore kind of approach to these two people. And while he wants to be with Laura Dern, ultimately he's more attracted to Dorothy Valens. Um, and not to get too into the nitty gritty details of the plot, but essentially this mystery just, you know, continues on. You find out a little bit more as time goes along. Ultimately, he has a crash. Like he, how does, how does um, Frank and Jeffrey become involved? Frank and Jeffrey? Kevin like and Dennis Hopper? I yeah, yeah. How, the I, lost photos, you mean? how did they end up actually spending time together? Oh, so he goes over, Jeffrey goes over to have sex with Dorothy. He's leaving, and that's when um, yeah. Frank comes in, and then he takes uh, Jeffrey for a joyride. Uh, Sandy gets involved, the police get involved. There's a lot of subterfuge. And I don't want to, again, get too in, into the details of this, but. We essentially see this mystery through to the end, and there's a very dramatic finale. Well, there's a finale to the actual plot, uh, the conflict between Jeffrey and Frank, and then David Lynch is like, well, we're gonna end this on a Norman Mailer sort of, you know, paradise in America ending. Yeah, and I think that the ending was, we were discussing earlier, that it's, like, it's a very interesting thing, because when we think about the recent, more recent cinema with, uh, with David Lynch and Mulholland Drive, it was not a happy ending. This feels like a happy ending until you think about like what you're seeing there. You know, that is like basically the father just recovered completely. You know, is that we have like an, a scene like 15 minutes before that, that is Isabella Rossellini completely delirious and naked in a, a Laura Dern Sandy's house. Well, Isabella Rossellini is just naked, hugging Kyle McLachlan and saying, I love you, my secret lover. And Laura Dern is just having like a meltdown, you know, about like, but you told me that you love me like a moment ago. And you're telling me that you were having sex with this woman, this deranged woman. And it's like at the end, it's that they're like just completely forgot about it. And they're like just robins all around. And it's true. <laughs> David Leach is not subtle at all. Because Laura Darren says in the middle of the movie, I had this dream that the Robins came and they just brought the light of love and everything was great. And we see like one Robin in front of the window, in the kitchen window, that is just holding one of the insects that we're seeing. And he's like, I, I had to say... Love that overcomes. Love overcomes. Love overcomes, but also at the same time, is that they are not like looking at the insect at all. Is that they decide not to look at it. Is like I think that this is a movie a bit more about how we choose to just look at what we want and just how we're going to be like pretending that the bad stuff has never happened because we never see we never see Savala Rosalini though, uh, song until the end. Yeah, at the very end. When and I have to I have to say that I questioned. Is what I is what we're watching on screen like wish fulfillment, or was she actually reunited with her son? It's unclear to me. It's unclear for me. It's like she was declared crazy, and she was just left in a hospital, you know. And it's like basically his kind of like yeah. is just imagining that he's like, oh, he was reunited with his kid, you know. He's wearing the hat because it's the only thing that I know that the kid had. Yeah, and. And, well, it's terrible that she uh, was on the receiving end of a tremendous amount of abuse, physical, sexual. Um, yeah. 
she's clearly unbalanced, and I don't think that's a result exclusively of the abuse that she suffers. So it's there's a lot that's ambiguous about this. Um, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts because at the beginning of this recording, you said initially you didn't like this film and you may have walked away from a second viewing with a different opinion. Oh yeah, it has been like completely different. And one of the things that I was, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that is that this reminded me of a pleasant view from the idyllic perspective about like how to display, you know, like the village. And then they are like the weirdness of David Lynch. David Lynch has like this kind of signature of just making you feel uneasy about what you're seeing on the screen. And he wants to apply that on this case from the perspective, okay, this is going to be a noir movie. If I had to give like a genre, I would say that this is noir. You have like a pseudo femme fatale, you have like a mystery, some murders, kidnapping, but there is a happy ending that usually in noir, there is not. But it felt like now as I uh, as I know a bit more about like the reality here, like living here, although this is set up like in the 50s and they play a lot with the kind of stereotypes that you will find on the 50s about like the girl in love with the quarterback of the football team, you know, that is his first love and they live in this small city and everything feels like completely idyllic and all these kind of things that you expect to see in a sweet love kind of movie set up in the 50s, is like Lynch tries to just like, how do you say, like twist it, like stab it and twist it a bit, you know, where like, okay, is this going to break? Or are they going to be like just pretending that nothing has happened and just trying to just hold to, uh, to the reality, you know, without looking what is behind that blue velvet curtain about like, look, all of this stuff that is happening is terrible. That you see like the insects below the grass is that this is what is like the basics of this reality that you're living in. But you pretend that you are not looking at it. Yeah, I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, do you do you know Leave it to Beaver? Did that make it across the pond? Leave it to Beaver? Leave it to Beaver. It was a show from I think the 50s, black and white, and it's uh it's like a picture perfect white family in suburbia, but there's kind of this zany kid named Beaver and he has some experience in each episode, but the family all comes together at the end. I would say that that Blue Velvet is like an episode of Leave it to Beaver. It's very clean, very family friendly in terms of what happens with um, Jeffrey's family and Sandy's family, but then he just dives down underneath and he wants to see everything disgusting that happened beneath the surface. Yep. Yeah. And the and, uh, disgusting parts are truly disgusting. The scenes with Dennis Hopper, and I wanted to hear your feedback, they were extremely shocking to me as a young, early 20s something. And they lost none of their shock from when I watched it again today. Like when he's inhaling whatever gas he's inhaling, and he kneels at Isabella Rossellini's vagina and his mom, uh, what does he say? Baby Mommy wants to fuck. Yeah. yeah. It's just horrifying. It's horrifying on screen. I think that I've been living, that I've been living here for too long. And I feel that it's, a, it's just one more fatigue. <laughs> You're desensitized. <laughs> I'm desensitized about the kind of style. I sure, whatever, you know. I even it's a little Rosalini is that he has the fetish, you know, like the uh, masochistic fetish that she actually has multiple times to kind of like and hit me until he cannot put up with what he says when what he's saying and he actually hits her. That actually to me was the most interesting scene of the film is when Kyle MacLachlan, who's, who's very innocent, all, all of a sudden he's been thrown into this voyeur sort of, he's hiding in a woman's closet watching her undress. Um, she begins to rape him at knife point and then ultimately they have sex and she's a masochist. She wants to be hit, she wants to have dirty talk and he doesn't want to do that, but he does it. So he becomes a sadist, he hits her and there's this moment where this this golden boy who was off at college or maybe not based on what we saw on the screen, he betrays himself and gives her what she wants and also achieves sexual satisfaction from it, but it's a very uncomfortable satisfaction. 
Regardless of what you think, you're shaking your head. I don't think you agree with oh, me. No, 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 but no, no. I... Amount of, of confusion in that film, in that scene. No, and I think that it's absolutely, you know, I think that you're right about that. I think that the confusion that he's having is like, I'm still having pleasure. It's like, I'm having sex with this gorgeous woman, but it's like, I'm doing something that is against what I believe that is right. Yeah. right? You know, and it's like he's actually supposed to feel. He shouldn't be doing that, but he gets aroused yeah. doing it. Yeah, I mean, he's like basically just peeking behind the curtain. You know, he's just he. The whole process of the movie for me is like he's like just opening slowly, like the curtain, and just stepping in because of his curiosity, and he's just dragging Laura Dern with him. And. Yeah. You see, like, all these kind of denizens of the other side. That is, like, Isabella Rossellini, Frank Booth. You know, they are, like, weird archetypes. I agree. And I think that's the interesting thing is watching this all-American boy who has the perfect girl, Laura Dern. But he oh, no, no, no. He doesn't have Laura there because Laura there loves Mike. I love that scene. For the first half. The first half. <laughs> She's completely committed to her high school boyfriend. Uh, yeah, you're right. Eventually he does get the girl and then everything's ruined because everyone finds out he was sleeping with Dorothy. Um, but it's not ruined. It's only ruined for 30 seconds. While Laura she there... Forgives, Laura Dern forgives him immediately. Yeah. Yeah, oh, he's... Yeah, yeah, for me it was like, oh yeah, now we're back to normal. Is like, now we have forgotten that this guy like shot someone, you know, that he actually had a deranged woman in her garden, you know, that he actually was a player and he was like just telling I love you to both of these girls at the same time. He's like, yeah, I don't know if polyamorous is something that it would be okay in the 50s here. He's <laughs> like, I, I think that you guys are going like too fast forward here. Um, also something that I was thinking about did you think about Mulholland Drive in any specific scene? To be honest, no, not at all. I I was super into this film and not thinking about anything else. Tell me what what scene reminded you of that. So not even when Dan Stockwell, like dressed as a very swell guy, starts doing like a part a playback playing of a Ray Orbison song. Like oh. the, the the silence theater, the club of silence in Mulholland oh, Drive. Silencio. Yeah, a cruel silencio, you know, when they actually uh, do a llorando, like the a crime version of Ray Orbison in Spanish. To be honest, it didn't remind me of that. It should have, but there were a lot of scenes where you essentially see the syntax of David Lynch's filmmaking, and you're like, yes, I can see this in yeah. Lost Highway, I can see this in Eraserhead. Yeah. Um, no, I, I missed that. Yeah. But Embarrassing, me, so I should have put... <laughs> <laughs> no, what I was going to say is that I was not watching it alone. And uh, the friend that I was watching it with, I, uh, I, he has never watched anything but David Lynch. And at that point, I was like, oh my God, we have to actually just watch this scene I played for him. And it's what it's, I, I was discussing with him. Is that I feel that this is one of the recurring topics for David Lynch, that he likes this kind of fake reality. And it's like doing someone that is doing a playback, but he's not really doing it. You know, it's like he's pretending to play normal pretending to and it's like a, this kind of reality pretending reality that it actually he likes to just piece it away you know and just showing you that is like how uneasy it feels when it's started like just falling apart so i did watch an interview with dennis hopper, hopper today um it was on the blu-ray again and he just couldn't stop using the adjective surrealism to describe David Lynch and this film and I feel like there's not a better word to describe it because there's nothing in this film that's firmly rooted in realism at all like it, it's all very very surreal nothing quite makes sense but it makes sense in this kind of dream state sort of way yeah uh, I would say yes I mean I agree with that but at the same time it's like I remember it way more surreal than what it was I felt like this is more quote unquote normal than the first half of Mulholland Drive, for example. And it's to the Mulholland Drive, the first part is a dream, you know. But it's that when things start like just getting weird on Mulholland Drive, they get really weird. So, was this David Lynch's third film? 
Uh, I don't remember. So I asked that question because I think that Blue Velvet sits right in between the complete surrealism of a racer head and the slight realism of the elephant the man. man. Like it's right in between. There is the fourth after Dune. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you like to pretend Dune. Dune didn't happen on this podcast, but God, you like such a piece of garbage. Um, yeah, I, I think that is like well at heart. I think that is failed. I still don't have like a clear idea exactly what he was trying to do with well at heart. <laughs> but Dune is is bad. It's just plain bad. Have I told you that I haven't seen Dune? You can keep it like that. You are not missing yeah. anything. Believe right. me. But I think that uh, so David Lynch wrote the script. Yeah, he is the only credited writer. Um, I think that in this story you can see you have like a window into the fucked up mind of David Lynch. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think. If anyone's looking to be introduced to the world of David Lynch, Blue Velvet is a great place to start, and it's also a good indicator. If you don't like this, probably don't see the rest of his films. I would say that probably Twin Peaks. I was debating between both of them because I think I agree with you that is that this is more "quote unquote" palatable. It's more grounded in reality. But weren't you just telling me before this recording that Twin Peaks? was just a family-friendly version of David Lynch. So if you want a, a more authentic look into his mind, you have to see the new Well, movie. but so, yeah, yeah, but what I'm saying is like as an entry point, as an entry point, I think that Twin Peaks just gives you like a taste about like, what is he about? Like the first season, it gives you like a taste about like, oh, this is his style. And then you can actually just start, you know, like just turning the volume up turning the craziness up, I would say that Blue Velvet will be like the next one. Or you can even start with the Elephant Man, but the Elephant Man, I don't think they have like too much release. No, the Elephant Man is, it's too straight a film in terms of, it's pretty straightforward. There's, yeah, I would not recommend the Elephant Man as an introduction into the mind of David Lynch. I would say Mulholland Drive, um, Eraserhead, Blue Velvet. I think you could safely skip Lost High, no, uh, Wild at Heart. Lost Highway might be a... Uh, Lost Highway is a good movie. ...out there with David Lynch. Like, it's pretty far out there. Um, what do you mean they far out there? In terms of, like, having a sensical plot, understanding mm. exactly this is what happened, this is how things resolve. Um, the fact that the actors change midway through the film, it's <laughs> it's not like... It shouldn't be your first taste of David Lynch. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, 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 or Mulholland Drive, for example, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I think that this is the only thing is that we have talked and we have watched like several of his movies here. For me, this was more enjoyable at this point. I could actually just understand it like in a bit of a better way, you know, like connecting to other topics that I see on his movies. I wonder if I actually, um, well, I wonder now because I actually did, I watched Mulholland Drive. Mulholland Drive, I think that it was my first David Lynch movie. I think that I had watched Twin Peaks, but I think that it was like my first movie. I think that it was like part of Doom and I said like, fuck this guy. That was, like, that was actually like the first one that I watched. I said, oh, I heard like pretty good things about David Lynch. I love Doom, you know, I read a book. So I'm going to be like watching this. I watched half of it, I said, like, fuck this guy. And no, David Lynch is not as good as people say. Well, it's interesting because the producer, which was a, an extremely famous Hollywood producer named Dino De Laurentiis, I believe, mm -hmm. he's the one who produced Dune, and that was a complete disaster. Um, somehow he got a hold of the script to Blue Velvet, and he approached David Lynch and like was like, what is this? And he's like, well, it's a film I'm thinking of. And he's like, I want to make this, even though Dune had been a disaster. So Dino De Laurentiis had to create his own production studio because no one would touch this, <laughs> no one. And now it's become, I would say, one of the most important cult class classics of the last 50 years. That may be a stretch, but I think this was made, what, 25, no, 35 years ago. Yeah. Almost 35 years ago. And I think this is a very important film and I think it's extremely unique. I don't think you can point to anything that's authentically as messed up or original as Blue Velvet. 
Oh yeah, Mulholland Drive, Lost Highway. <laughs> well, outside of David Lynch, I'm just saying there's nobody as original or unique as David Lynch. Well, that's not true. There's no. nobody in a particularly brand. It's, yeah, but I mean, it's sure. If you want to do, for me, it's like an easy surrealist. Because surreal, you know, Gondry is surreal, if you go with that. But it's like, the, what what they're trying to accomplish is like a Gondry, for example, he's surreal, but he tries to uh, capture like the imagination feeling about like going to be like doing like pretty crazy stuff, but it's a stuff that is going to be like letting your imagination fly. And I think that David Lynch, when he does something surreal, is a bit more like with the perspective, he's like, I'm going to make you afraid of letting your imagination fly for what you can see. I'm having a hard time thinking about anything but the Green Hornet, which I know isn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I this kind of a so the Green Hornet and Bjork music videos, what was there? <laughs> there was uh, the science of sleep, the time science, I always follow mine, be kind, rewind. I mean, there, look, it's like it's, it's surreal, it doesn't make any kind of sense, but he makes it, you know, like if a kid was imagining what it was happening. So it's imaginative. And it's like, David Lynch is imaginative, but it's imaginative in a disturbed way. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I'm trying to think, there has to be like someone else that does stuff. I mean, not exactly like him. But honestly, I would say David Fincher is kind of like this. I would say Fight Club, the game. It's kind of yeah. it's more rooted in realism, but it's also surreal. It is this very dark world that the director wants us to inhabit. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I want to bring up specifically the performance of Dennis Hopper, which I think is just mind blowing. May he yeah. rest in peace. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dennis Hopper had just gotten out of rehab. This role was offered to a couple pretty famous people in Hollywood. They did, they rejected it. Um, I'm pretty sure Val Kilmer was offered the role and he said, no, this is pornography. Dennis Hopper had just gotten out of rehab and he called David Lynch and said, I have to play Frank Booth because I am Frank Booth. Um, wow. And then you see him essentially inhale poppers, right? And just yeah. go crazy on a bunch of people. Um, his role and that character are so fucking intense that I think it could lose a little bit of its impact over the last 35 years, but it doesn't. It doesn't for me personally. What he does on screen is still extremely shocking. It, it makes me feel dirty and gross, and it makes me feel like I'm absolutely in the the world of David Lynch. Yeah, yeah, no, it's perfectly written. If I think about, do you remember what I heard, uh, what was the name of the uh, of the killer that starts chasing them? Uh, Steve Buscemi? No, it's no. not Steve Buscemi, it's... Uh, uh, Willem uh, Dafoe. Willem Dafoe, yeah. He's like, I think that that's a similar character, but I don't think that is the develop enough for just getting to the same disturbing level. Yeah, agreed, completely. And but is it actually, does, does actually like, just seeing this movie makes me like Wild at Heart less. Is that possible? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to be like, lowering the score, but I just feel it's like some of the aspects, like for example, Frank Booth and the William, sorry, like Dennis Hopper and William the four characters, is like there is a bit of parallelism. I'm not going to say that they are exactly the same, but there is like a bit of parallelism about like what you're trying to depict. You know, like a disturbing, deranged man that is just thinking about violence, sex. And it's like, I, I just feel like Dennis Hopper, I won't say that elevates it, but it just drives it home completely. It's like, wow, it's yeah. the opposite of elevating it. It like runs it into the ground and drags it through the dirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Possible. yeah, but I mean, I mean, from the perspective of just selling it, is that like you believe it, you actually just find like that guy that is like, maybe when I watch it the first time, I didn't buy it. You know, for me, this character was like, what is he doing? This is just surreal. You know, but so we are not in a way that is like I'm getting into this. It's more like it's just pushing me out of it. And now when I watch it again, it's like wow, yeah, okay. I didn't find it like that disturbing as you did. It's like I just thought, like, okay, it's a kink. Whatever. But it's still like selling an idea that is like, okay, it's scary, but it also just talks it just gives testimony about like how time has changed. How like we are when we're talking about like sex and we're talking about like kinks. 
is that we have seen less significant anymore. And this is actually displaying it in the contrast of this is the 50s. This is like perfect suburban America. Something like this is like the, and I'm pretty sure that it's like Lynch thought about like, what is the most disturbing thing that you could see that is not murder or, you know, like just gore or whatever. And it's like, a fetish like this, someone that just gets high with something and just pretends to be a baby, like just raping her mother, his mother. So just a fun fact, Don't You Fucking Look At Me was voted as the number 74 of the 100 greatest movie lines. <laughs> so there's a scene in the film which is incredibly disturbing to me. It sounds like it, it was not that for you, but... Um, Dorothy has discovered Jeffrey in her apartment and she forces him to strip at knife point and she rapes him, not in a penetrative way, but there's definitely like, he's doing things because he's at knife point. They're interrupted by Frank. So Jeffrey hides in the closet and Frank has one of the most explicit sexual interactions um, with Dorothy, I think in the entire film. Um, I literally have no idea where I was going from here. None. I mean, he does pop her and he, he goes crazy. Oh, this is what I was going to tell you. Sorry. It's just a piece of trivia. So um, Isabella Rossellini and Dennis Hopper had never worked together before ever before this scene. And she's wearing a blue velvet robe and she's sitting in a chair and Dennis Hopper demands that she spread her legs very, very wide. Um, he had no idea that she was actually naked, but she was. And so his reaction to her spreading her legs is like 100% authentic. <laughs> which I think are the sorts of things like you can do in independent cinema that yeah. like gives you super authentic reactions. Um, and then you have him on his knees sniffing poppers, begging to fuck mommy, uh, which, you know, it's just, it's incendiary no matter if 35 years have passed since the original. Least yeah. So I want to be asking you that question because I actually want to answer it. So do you think that this is timeless or timely? Timeless, 100%, 100%. Yeah, I think that it's also like this quote unquote cheating for this question when you actually are setting your action like 30 years before you actually saw this movie. But I, I, again, I see this as like two questions. Does, do like the circumstances and the technology of the time reduce this to its time period? Or are the themes and the values it explores truly timeless? And the fact that there's a seedy underbelly to everything that seems bucolic, that, yeah. that's a pretty timeless thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that is that is the same. Well, it's partial, as I was saying earlier, it's partially the same topic to, uh, to Ice White Side. Because as I said at the end, is like, as we were discussing, is like, they end up together. Is that like, we don't know if they're going to be happy or not, but it says like, well, we can just leave all of this behind, but we need to fuck. You know, it's exactly the same thing here. It's like at the end is that they end up together. The father just comes out of the hospital. They solve like this noir mystery, you know, with police, with corrupt police involved into it, you know, and everything is fine. The families are like one together and the robbing is sitting the uh, the Beatles. Which, by the way, David Lynch assured everybody that incredibly fake Robin was a real Robin. And it's because that Robin is built off a, a real dead Robin the production company found in the street, which echoes Eraserhead, where the baby was an actual dead calf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. That's, that's disturbing. Yeah, for me, it's completely, completely timeless. It's like I'm still a shock that I didn't like this movie back then. And I remember that most of my friends that they were watching all the David Lynch movie at the same time, you know, it's like all of us, we got together into Twin Peaks and then we started watching Mulholland Drive, Lost Highway. Dune, yeah, we did. My former roommate, that if you are listening to this, you are wrong. He used to defend Dune as a decent movie. I, say, I got it to the point of just saying, that, okay, maybe it wasn't that good. But he used to love Blue Velvet. And I remember that he, he wasn't good. I said, now I realized that I was wrong. He said, this is a good movie. And this is a movie that I will watch like 20 years in the future and I will still enjoy it. I agree with that. And it's interesting that we just watched a Stanley Kubrick film because I would say the two 
well, there are three, but I'm not going to name Danny Boyle. There are two directors that really got me interested in cinema, and it was Stanley Kubrick and David Lynch. Those were the two where I saw their films, and I was like, I, I need to see more by these people. I don't care what they show me, but I want to see more. Did you, did you really say Danny Boyle? Were you joking over your series? I wasn't joking. Uh, because in my early 20s, I saw Millions. I saw 28 Days Later. I saw um, Train Spotting. Party, yeah. And I thought, this is something interesting. It's something different than I can see at my local movie theaters. I don't consider Danny Boyle like at the same like a level. Master, but I would definitely say that Danny Boyle, Stanley Kubrick, and David Lynch are three directors that really wanted me to watch more, more okay. cinema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get it. Yeah, for me, no, Danny Boyle, no. I remember watching Trash Spotting and then watching like 20 days later. He's like, Zombies don't run, Danny Boyle. Stop it. Zombies don't run. <laughs> what about the Tilda Swinton Leo, Leo DiCaprio film that was so good? Directed which, by Danny Boyle. Which one? The Le- Island or something like that? Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> no. I'm sorry. No. Just, just no. Just say no. She said that. But people told me that it was a bit better than I remember it. I'm not going to watch it. I'm just vetoing it now, publicly. <laughs> I don't want to watch the island. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, would you watch Blue Velvet again? Yeah. Yep. I liked it enough to buy on Blu-ray. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, as I was telling you before we started recording, is like when I was done with uh, with Blue Velvet, I played a couple of scenes from Mulholland Drive and other David Lynch movies for my friend, and I almost like just how do you say? Uh, for him to start watching Twin Peaks like right away. I was like, yeah, you do need to watch Twin Peaks. You need to watch it right now. Uh, so yeah, I will watch this again, definitely. Uh, would you recommend it? Yeah, I would recommend this to anyone. Yeah, yeah, me too. I would recommend it. I I had a feeling that most people that I would recommend it to, that they would be the target audience, they had already watched it. Yeah, I would buy that. You know, it's like I'm thinking, would you recommend it to your mother? Would you recommend it to your husband? Yes, he told me he had already seen it. And I don't think he was the biggest fan. And yes, I would recommend this to my mom. Um, I don't know that she would like it and I would not watch it with her. But I think this is an important enough film that I would recommend it to anybody. What did you think of the scene when, uh, when they are being chased by the yellows? ex-boyfriend Mike and they just park in front of the house and at the range naked Isabella Rossellini just comes from the background while no one is paying attention to her to be honest I absolutely loved that scene because there was this juxtaposition about like oh there's this little high school drama that's happening versus holy shit this woman had her husband and son kidnapped and she's basically imploding and Jeffrey's playing a part in both of these which one matters I really liked it. it. It stood out to me when I watched it this time. Yeah, no, I, I really liked it too. It just left me like, wow, this is this is what made exactly what you said, like the just position, you know, like the uh, the contrast into yeah, we have like the sweetheart story, and then we have like the noir movie, and it's like how both of them they are like just colliding into a single scene. Yeah, I I really love that scene this. This time through, I don't think I had paid attention to it before this, but I liked it this time. Yeah. Uh, could you remember this movie? So this was interesting because um, as I watched it for the third or fourth, fourth time, I remembered the first third of the movie 100%. I had no idea where it was going to go after the first third. Uh, it was like watching a new movie. So. Did this movie make an impact in my memory? 100%. Am I going to remember the specifics of how it resolves? No, I'm not going to. That's interesting. I remember like half of it, let's say. Or um, yeah, more or less half of it, let's say. I remember like some of the scenes in the brothel that they never confirmed that it's truly a brothel, but they never really say that it's not, you know? I remember that part. I remember how he was like kidnapped. but what I didn't remember, and I, f- I feel like pretty dumb, this is like the main reason why I feel dumb, is like noir is one of my favorite genres. And this is a noir movie by the books. And it's like, I couldn't remember that like they use all the elements, you know, that I felt like 
how come could I sort of just ignore this? Because I used to watch like a lot of noir movies back then. I don't disagree with you that this is a noir film, but it's very different than oh, like... definitely. Okay, but sorry. but you were you were connecting earlier uh, with David Fincher. Yes, David Fincher is also someone that likes to do like postmodernist noir cinema. That's true. That's true. So are you talking about postmodernist? <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm just saying that is that they they are adapting classic formats in a modernist way. You know, they are adapting it to the current time, but not adapting about like let's change it to the fashion of the days and like just changing the language and a couple of details. Is that they are like, just changing it to the sensibilities of the time, and they are like just giving it. Is like for example, David Fincher likes to be like just pretty cold and just observing things from outside. Super clinical. Exactly, and they and David Lynch actually just loves like making everything weird. You know, making everything like, okay, what about if this that feels normal is like let's just actually like crumble it down. Let's actually just turn it upside down. Let's see how do you feel with this. He likes to actually just makes people feel uneasy. The same way that Haneke likes make making people feel terrible with themselves. Yeah, awful. Yeah, Lynch actually likes to make people feel like, oh, I don't feel comfortable seeing this. It's not that it's gross. It's not like a like show, you know, or any kind of porn, like torture porn kind of thing. But he's using, and that's the reason why I feel that this is a good movie, is because he actually, you can see that like he's actually using what it came before, like the noir genre, and he's applying his praise. He's like saying, like, I'm going to even using like some elements that you know. And, and just you applies f- his own taste and uh, aesthetic to it, yeah. He throwing builds you on an established genre. Yeah, he's even like throwing you more off because you think that you know exactly how these things work. Is that, oh, the guy is going to be, you know, is that basically just thinking about uh, like his code, you know, a rear window and stuff like that. Is that, oh, he's going to be like just in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for the audience, Blake just rolled his eyes. He's not the biggest Hitchcock fan, but whatever. One day I will make you watch like a couple of him. Uh, but when he's like just hiding in the closet, it's like you know that story. You have seen like many times that story about like someone just is seeing this and then you're going to have like a tense scene how they actually try to get out of bed. But here he actually just plays that, you know, like you were saying, like the sexual game with Rosalini, that I think that is like, it's just playing with the expectations of the audience and then just throwing you off and just dragging you to his wall. I think you described it very well. I think he subverts expectations of the audience so well that you're yeah. constantly shocked or disgusted or surprised with what's happening. Um, while fitting neatly into these kind of genre boundaries that you're talking about. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I feel like is that while our heart is even cheaper than I remember it, <laughs> you know, how, how he applies this cheese, if he's like, okay, you really rush through this, uh, through this screen. The worst thing I ever could have done for Wild at Heart is to have you watch Blue Velvet. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Uh, is there anything artistic about it? About Blue yeah, Velvet? Yeah, absolutely. No I mean, so, David Lynch not only directed but wrote the script, which I think is important to recognize. He thinks he's a rarity in that he can direct what he writes. And I think there's a lot from a direction perspective that makes this interesting, as well as from a script perspective. I, yeah, there's a lot to this. That's artistic, not necessarily beautiful because a lot of it's grotesque, but there's a lot that's artistic. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I think that they are like, uh, as, as you were saying, like the scene, I think that you were describing like the most artistically I don't know, like an evaded or whatever. It's like how the camera goes down. You see the insect that's a bit on the uh, on the nose. I think that there are a couple of other ones, like when she, when Rosalini is singing at the uh, at the bar and the likes. There are a couple of small scenes that they are good, artistically good. But I think that he hadn't achieved the kind of uh, expertise that he did with Mulholland Drive. That I think that is a his pinnacle. That is like that. That's the top of his career. I, I can't disagree with that. I mean, Mulholland drives like in another dimension. Yeah. 
I absolutely love Blue Velvet, but it does feel a little bit like a sophomore effort. Like this is a, a an important filmmaker, but he's still figuring out who he is and where he wants to yeah. go. Whereas yeah. Mulholland Drive, he's like, I have arrived. This is what I want you to experience. Yeah, and I, I would like to actually watch Lost Highway because for me, as I was Lost Highway after like a week after Mulholland Drive, that I was like so mind blown by it, by Mulholland Drive, that I was Lost Highway the following week or three days later. I was like. Yeah, this is good. This is almost the same movie. I mean, it's not the same yeah, movie. Experience. I watched Blue Velvet and I was like, I'm going to get his next film. Oh, this is just a brilliant. It's so good. I don't understand it, but it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's completely fair. Uh, we already said about this, if it's a tiny piece, but would you turn this into a TV show? No, and this builds off a conversation we were having before the podcast. I, I feel like Twin Peaks would have benefited from being a movie and not a TV show. Uh, so I, I just think that Blue Velvet, it's, it's two hours of entertainment, if not 90 minutes. Um, I don't think we need to see 10 hours, 12 hours, 20 hours of this, no. I don't know, I, I'm a bit torn about this one because I, I would like to see more. I would like to see more about like him like destroying the 50s paradigm of perfect America, Did you know? I don't know if I was ruined by watching all of the extra lost footage, but I was like, yeah, mm. this shouldn't have been in here, this shouldn't have been in here, this shouldn't have been in here. So <laughs> there are interesting characters like uh, Frank's evil friend that has the face with makeup. Yeah. Like I wanted to know more about that character, so maybe I would like to see that expanded, but overall, no, I wouldn't want this as a TV show. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious about it. So it was Dean Stockwell, who was the guy, that is the guy from yeah. Paris, Texas. Did you, do you like and Paris, the Texas? Father from Clueless. That's true. <laughs> Did you like Paris, Texas? As I recall, I was extremely underwhelmed by that film. Hmm. Didn't we review it on this podcast? It was like one no. of our no, we watched this movie. I think that we watched this movie like way, way before we did the podcast. Probably was like one of the first movies that we ever discussed together. Yeah. That I had I pending to watch. Yeah. And yeah, we watched it like apart. Yeah. <laughs> As a friend of mine was telling me, I, this was a gift from a friend that he had the movie for a very long time, Paris, Texas, and he gave it to me as this is the most boring zombie movie that I ever watched. I'm pretty sure Paris, Texas was our very first episode. It's line five on the spreadsheet. Well, but we never review it in the podcast. Oh, I see. The, pod, the spreadsheet is incomprehensible. Yeah, is it. It, this right. actually is like when we started talking, you know, about like, okay, let's just sell like some kind of a score and everything. So this was like the first one. I remember okay. like starting this one. I remember like seeing at the Broadway and everything. I was discussing that. Uh, and then we stopped for a very long time. We started just watching movies and not recording it on the podcast. Sorry, on the on the spreadsheet. But we only started the podcast with Little Children. What a great pick for our first episode. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I would be curious to uh, turn it into a TV show, like seeing a bit more of it, but that's basically what Three Peaks became. So I'm not completely disappointed. I would have liked a bit more of this with Laura Dern and Karma Lachlan, because I think that they have like good chemistry on the screen. And actually when I compare Laura Dern, this Laura Dern with the one a while at heart, but this is like, oh, it's the same actress. Is that that's pretty impressive, like the change of registry that they do that she does from one movie to the other. Yeah, I, I do think she's a, a very talented actress. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we score this? Let's do it. So this was my pick, so it's your turn to score first. This is an eight for me. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it's slightly better than a good film. It has some issues, but I think overall it stands the test of time. It's a very good film. I. I will rewatch this more than once in the future. Um, I really like this movie. That's interesting. I mean, I was between. I, I'm going to be an 8.5. 8.5, ah. yeah, but just from the perspective that I want to just 
penalize myself for not liking it back then. <laughs> well, it's just, I'm reflecting it's about like, it's penance, you know, it's, it's a bit more like just looking back at myself and say like, how were you sometimes of not seeing what this movie was about? Well, I'm impressed you picked it and now you like that movie even more. Yeah, no, I'm, I've been impressed. I mean, this is, this is a movie that confirms my love for David Lynch, you know, is that, for example, if I were to watch a straight story, I would say like, eh, you know, it has been okay. It hasn't been, it couldn't make me like or dislike David Lynch more. But this yeah, movie I feel like his straight, straight films, you can fall on either side of feeling good or bad about them. You have to go into his dark spaces. You have to go to the dark side to figure out if you like him and his, his yeah. stuff. Yeah, basically it's like watching, what was the last movie by Haneke? Happy Ending? The last one? Yeah. Yeah, I think so with... Um, with Hooper, no? Yes, and it was about race relations in France. Yeah, I never watched it, but you told me that it wasn't really like his style. It was... Eh, I, I just felt kind of meh about it. It's not that it was a bad film, it's just not what I want when I go to see a Haneke film. Yeah. yeah, so for example, if I were to watch like, okay, The Elephant Man, and then it was The Straight Story by David Lynch, I would see like two decent movies, but I wouldn't have seen good Lynch movies. You, wouldn't you need have to watch like, Eraserhead, Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive. So have I, have, I have a fun fact to you. I never finished watching Eraserhead. <laughs> so right now for our know. audience, <laughs> yes, like Blake is just in shock, like shaking his head, like no, no. I, I think you would like it. I think I was a bit of a fanboy when I saw it for the first time, but I, I think it's very interesting as a feature film from David Lynch. Yeah, I think that I have to watch it now again, because back then, the 15 minutes of the main character like just walking at the beginning, they just made me think of the 15 minutes of Solaris by Tarkovsky driving. That is Both a inspired fucky. pieces of cinema. <laughs> sure, sure. But both things that they don't really need to assist. You know, is that like you can just compress this in two minutes. So yeah, I, I would have to watch it again. That's a movie that I have always like had pending. I think that is even on the Guterian collection. So when they should just revisit it. But then, so anything else to say about Blue Velvet? Uh, just that this really, for me, and I hope for you, this film stands the test of time. And if you want, if you've never seen anything by David Lynch, I'm guessing nobody that's listening hasn't seen a David Lynch film. But I feel like this is a very good introduction into his fucked up world. And if you like it, you're going to want to watch more. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Uh, so what are we watching next? <laughs> well, <laughs> we're gonna watch Short Bus. <laughs> I like that you're like just laughing what you're saying, you just drop it. He said, like, we're going to yeah, watch Short Bus. No, and just no, moving away. I'm embarrassed, it's my pick. I've never seen it. I just want to watch Short Bus. I want to hear what all the fuss is about, so. There was another movie that I, I think that I didn't finish watching. I think that I got to a point that this is just poor. So, curious to see. Well, fingers crossed. That's what I'm in the mood <laughs> for. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, now that poor half is like half done, half yeah. done poor, we have to look like on the, for other yeah. sources of poor. There are the, the untraditional uh, sources for that. Exactly. Oh man, uh, that was great. Yeah, to everyone that is out there, just watch David Lynch, watch all his movies. Well, not while I harp, but everything else, yeah, just watch it. Mm -hmm. Wash your hand. <laughs> Bye.